Hey, Sheila. Hey, everyone. Okay, let's do refuge. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by the merits I create through listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by the merits I create through listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly by the merits I create through listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Martin, you're muted. There we go. Yeah, it's just, I can see I, I have the blur background on here because, uh, again, I'm, I'm in the car. I don't know why, uh, why I keep doing these things from in cars, but I'm in the car. But I just noticed that um, Zoom doesn't um, think my uh, my ear is part of me, but rather the background. So, <laughs> so it's, it's not there. Uh, yeah, so um, maybe we can start by uh, just a short meditation to uh, to ground ourselves and just bring our attention home as a way of you know releasing whatever um, you're at the end of your day. So it's probably been a lot of stuff going on and lots and uh, lots of things, lots of thoughts about this and that. So see if we can just gently release all of that and then just bring ourselves um, into this present moment. So finding just a comfortable posture, um, allowing our attention to drop down from the head and down into the body. Just um, connecting with the um, just the mystery uh, and the awesomeness of, of being embodied. So we don't have to tend to it, but the the body just somehow keeps us alive. And there's just a million billion processes happening beyond our control, but that just allow us to to be here and do all the things we we want to do. This this field of energy, tactile sensations. You see, kind of like a, you know, pouring water into a glass. See if we can allow our attention, our awareness to just fill the body and drop into the body, permeate the body. And specifically, we can turn our attention to the breathing. And see if you can have um, like a full body sense of the breath. Um, and as we breathe in, we are literally bringing energy into the body. And um, that, bod that, that energy is being distributed or channeled into every part of the body. Every cell of our body needs oxygen, needs that energy. So in a very literal sense, we're actually breathing into every cell of our body. See if you can just have a sense of that. So when, as we breathe in, air flows in and it just permeates the entirety of our, of our bodies. And then breathing out, we just follow the breath out. And then breathing in, breathing out. It's like um, you can almost have a sense of a fluctuating field of energy. So you're bringing air and energy into the body, and then it's you're exhaling and you're just offering it back to the world in a sense. And 
Also on the out breath, you can take the opportunity to, as you breathe out, just have this natural sense of releasing, relaxing, letting go. And as you breathe in, just have this sense of uh, heightened awareness or um, a bit of energizing, um, a bit of more clarity. You breathe in and you heighten your awareness, you bring your um, attention into this present moment. And then you breathe out and you just relax, release, and let go. And, you know, if there are other appearances in your mind, the thoughts and the memories, the impulses, the emotions, you just... Breathing in, breathing out. It's like... Um, being in a cocktail party. So you're talking to one person, but you're in this uh, environment of many things going on, but your focus is on this one person in front of you. You're giving them you know, undivided attention and everything else is kind of falling into the background. You're giving your full attention to the breath, all the others background. Paying attention to the breath as if it was the most important thing in your life, which it quite possibly is. See if you can bring curiosity and openness, maybe even a sense of awe to, to the breathing. And then gently release your focus or your attention on the breath specifically and just allow your attention to become more broad or wide. Just take in the body as a whole. Pay attention to your entire field of awareness to your mind. Just notice what it's like to be you in this moment. And then in that space, if you can allow an intention for this, um, this session or this, this meeting to arise, like tune into why you're here, what brought you uh, this online session um, and just have the intention of uh, whatever you encounter may be a benefit to you so may it help you develop greater clarity insights more happiness may it decrease your suffering uh, and help you understand the process of suffering within yourself and then potentially may that radiate outwards and, and benefit others so that um, we do this together also as a way of bringing something to, to other sentient beings, to the world. 
and helping them to live lives that are more fulfilling, that are more meaningful, that contain more joy, clarity, and wisdom, and love. Uh, and then with that motivation, that intention, we can open up our eyes and uh, kick this thing off, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, as I said once again, I find myself in a car doing this. Uh, and the reason for this is that I'm currently uh, in New Zealand. And um, this is part of a um, um, trip to see um, a, a property in New Zealand that has been donated to what's called um, the Center for Contemplative Research, which is a project uh, started by uh, Alan Wallace, um, Dr. Alan Wallace, uh, to many people, and also um, Lama Alan Wallace to, uh, to also a, a lot of people. I don't know if you're um, aware of any of his teachings. If you're not, I, I encourage you to um, look him up and, and maybe uh, have a look at one of the many books he's written or just one of the many talks or teachings that are available online. Um, but anyways, it was, um, so this was a talk that I just attended at the university, um, which name, sorry, what's Canterbury University um, in Christchurch, New Zealand. So, um, and they are looking there to establish um, a department of um, contemplative research or um, consciousness studies and that kind of thing. But the, the talk was basically on how can we, um, when we're finding ourselves in, in Eurocentric modernity, I mean, we live in a culture that has sprung from scientific uh, materialism and you know the money and the many awesome discoveries um, of science. I mean, we have uh, we have available to us so many things that that prior generations have not had. You know, we have amazing healthcare and we have amazing facilities. We we really do. Most of us live in in great affluence. Um, and, and a lot of that affluence has, has sprung from scientific discoveries and from Eurocentric um, culture. But um, the price for that has been rather high. Uh, we, we live also in a culture now where depression is more prevalent than in any other situation, any other culture, any other time on our planet. Um, you know, young people suffering from depression and anxiety, and and we really don't, um, we can't really figure out why. And the solutions um, that we are offering, which also come from a lot of them from from science, is you know, you pop a pill, and uh, we're trying to understand the brain so that we can create better drugs, so that we can treat people better. Uh, but none of that is seemingly working too well so we're we're better off in one sense than we've anyone's ever been and then in another sense we're also <laughs> mentally and psychologically worse off than anyone's ever been um so there's um there's something going on that uh isn't really being addressed um so alan wallace's talk was um you know offering in this context of uh, of these scientists, these psychologists, this this university environment, um, offering the the possibility that you know within the contemplative traditions there might be uh, some answers to these questions, there might be some answers to you know the true sources of suffering of how to how to cultivate. Um, mental balance and equilibrium and, um, and and wisdom that then can can bring a type of happiness that is not dependent on all the outer stuff you know a happiness that's not dependent on 
acquiring more things and more fame and more reputation and more status. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was, so it's quite interesting, and it it um, uh, it to me it it seemed like it um, this talk fell into some really fertile um, ground, uh, and I also I just also came from uh, Melbourne where I where I live. There was um, uh, there was a conf mindfulness conference with um, uh, you know a lot of science on on mindfulness being presented the, the usual kind of scientific stuff which is fantastic and great but <laughs> for the first time and you know at any mindfulness conference uh, scientific mindfulness conference i've ever attended there was also talks on um uh, they they actually had uh, brought both buddhist and and buddhist contemplatives there was um christian mystics and others so they actually had talks um uh, on you know what what can these traditions actually bring to to the study of, of the things they're studying which is it's interesting that uh yeah it's taken a while and it's it's like when mindfulness was initially uh, 40 years ago and the, the scientific study of meditation and mindfulness really started it was really important and i think for a good reason that it was kind of brought out of its cultural and, and religious context and then studied you know in, within this hyper secular framework but at the same time uh, a lot of a lot of babies was thrown out with a lot of bath water at that time so I, I'm really happy that um, this seems to be an openness now for for delving deeper into the traditions from um, where these techniques, if you want to call it that, originated. And understanding that if you're going to study the mind, uh, you know, like any instrument, you kind of need to own the mind. You can't rely on untrained people um, to, to study the effects of something like mindfulness and meditation. You kind of need uh, professionals. You, you need the, the Olympic level, um, practitioners uh you need the yogis uh and um the serious if you want to call them professional meditators uh to make any you know headway from from um where we are at this point and that's being that's really being brought in and uh there was just there was two centers um of contemplative research started in in melbourne one at monash university and one at University of Melbourne recently, where these uh, things really start to happen. Um, so um, um, I feel like I went on often a bit of a tangent there, uh, but this is something that for me is is really really close to my um, heart and something that I find to be of the utmost importance in the world because. We, we can't, I don't think we can heal this planet. I mean, we're on the brink of uh, illness. I all know this. We're, uh, we're, uh, this, we're in a time of unprecedented crisis. There's never been a, a greater threat to the very existence of humanity and our planet than what is currently going on uh, with, obviously, with climate change and all of the various um, conflicts and and just the overuse of uh, the earth resources this whole paradigm of you know we just hit eight billion people and if the good life for eight billion people is going to be consuming stuff to in order to find happiness we're in a serious serious problem because uh, we're running, rapidly running out of resources so we need there really needs to be this paradigm shift um, where we start looking for happiness in in uh, in other places and instead of looking for happiness uh, in outer circumstances and you know what we consume can consume through the senses we really need to start emphasizing inner happiness and uh inner flourishing inner well-being 
that can only come from a deeper understanding uh, of, of um, well, ultimately deeper understanding of reality on a different level, but that, that understanding can only come from us turning our gaze inwards uh, and develop the inner qualities. Um, I mean, we've, um, we've hit the end of the road uh, in our attempts to, to become happy by fixing the, um, the outer circumstances of the world around us. We, we all need to turn inward uh, to find our own um, joy, our own um, happiness, to be, you know, be content and whole. Um, but also, as an extension of that, to uh, well, to save the planet, uh, it it needs to happen. And I I don't know if I'm I, I don't I, I I'm certainly not a pessimist. Um, I don't think maybe I'm not an optimist, but I think I'm being a realist when I'm saying that um, I, th I think there are signs that this is happening and um, that this kind of um, inquiry is actually coming to the fore of, of even now the scientific community. So yeah, I'm, I'm quite um, I'm quite happy to to see that that happening. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, sorry. Go. I just just gonna ask you if um, for any comments or, or reflections or questions on that that rant. <laughs> yeah, so please go ahead. She sometimes has problem with her mic. Oh, there you go. Here it goes. Um, was there somebody named Brother David Stendhal? At, at the um, conference, he's a Christian um, contemplative who um, often uh, goes to these things. Hmm. He's pretty yeah. Um, yeah. So the um, one of the the problems with the conference was that it was supposed to be hybrid in the sense that um, it was supposed to be online and uh, in person but only one of the days ended up to being in person. So um, there might've been, and he might've been one of the presenters or one of the people attending the conference, but I did not um, meet him, unfortunately, no. Martin, I have a comment. Um, I did not think what you said was a rant whatsoever. I think it's very realistic and I appreciate that you're bringing these things up. So thank you for that. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I thought I would uh, uh, start this session today actually to uh, by just checking in and seeing if there's anything that's um, uh, like alive for you in your practice, if there's any um, challenges or there might also have been some like recently gained insights or you know anything that um, so I thought we could start there if there's something that you know any of you want to um, bring to the table as it were and we could maybe start from there I have to mention this. It has to do with um, my anger and uh, it, it took the form of irritation, which is a form of anger. And um, I, I know that I don't get really, really angry anymore, usually hardly ever, but I, I do have this, this little streak of irritation and, and arrogance. And uh, the other day um, it, I, was, I was talking on the chat, um, not knowing I was talking to everyone and talking about how stupid the other people were uh, because oh. they, they didn't it was a, it was a computer problem it wasn't a problem with the audio and i knew exactly what was going on and i told them what to do um starting hours ago um the first time i just said okay i'm going to let you guys do this i'm going to go running you figure it out for yourself although i i was pretty sure what was going on at that time then later on when geshe was even getting a little impatient with it 
and um and someone said well i don't know i just don't know what to do and, but there is another computer on in this room and so i put in the chat finally i said something i put in the chat i said that's the issue turn that computer off disconnect it from zoom because it was an echo you know wow it, it was like when you're when you call the radio station and you you have your your radio on with the phones because you want to hear yourself on the radio that was in the old days it's the same principle and once i figured it out you know i said something but then they weren't doing it and i could tell they weren't doing it and so i was getting a bit impatient um but then they finally did do it and they didn't take all that long to do it and um but then later somebody came and I was chatting to her, not knowing that I was chatting to everyone. And I was talking about how, oh, and then they're at, uh, offering stupid advice. And uh, oh boy, one of them got so upset. She was going to tell the head mama. And um, I, I, was, I felt so bad because I didn't want to hurt them, but actually I did want to hurt them. And so I have enough yeah. people, you know, but I did want to hurt them. And that's, that's what happened. It wound up basically shaming me not because of them, but because of how I felt. I felt bad that I attacked them. Um, they, you know, yeah. and yeah, but that was really interesting because the, the talk that he was giving actually was about that. Um, I, and wow. everyone, yeah. everyone like him, he took it in stride and the head mama took it in stride. And I did apologize immediately. I wasn't going on and on about it, but I, I thought that was interesting. That's something that I learned this week. Or it was a good thing, all in all. Thank you guys. <laughs> um wow thank you so much for sharing um and i think in general um uh, you know the the things we're saying you know and most of it's you know just going on in our head uh it's um i think it's lucky that you know it's, it's not being broadcasted to on zoom meetings <laughs> most of the time um but I think anger is uh, it is a really tricky one because um, certainly in, in in Buddhism and certainly in, in um, I, I guess especially like the the original forms of, of Buddhism you know what's now known as the Theravada tradition um, is uh, you know the anger is really the troublemaker it's it's a it's a problem to be subdued and um, uh, you, you really just need to get rid of it. Um, and um, I think sometimes, um, yeah, that, that, that causes some, some, some problems because, you know, if you then look at, uh, you know, maybe later forms of, of um, you know, when, when Theravada tradition um, uh, evolved into the Mahayana and then the Vajrayana traditions, then kind of that view of, of anger changes a little bit so then from a from a tantric perspective anger is just energy and that energy can actually be transformed uh and you have you know you have these wrathful deities that are you know, stomping around on people's skulls and being just extremely wrathful uh but obviously that you know that that wrath isn't hate or um uh in a sense it you can sometimes say that, you know, like in the teachings of Shantideva, he speaks about turning anger in upon the affliction. So he uses metaphors as, you know, raging war on on the afflictions. And, and um, yeah, so, so their anger, in a sense, is an energy that can be used and utilized and, and transformed into uh, awakening. And also from that perspective, if... Um, at the deepest level, then then anger is just this. Um, uh, there's this. It's 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 sprung out of actually at the deepest level out of wisdom. So it's this clarity of discernment, for example, where you can really tell this from that and right from wrong, and so on. So there's this. Um, I don't think we should dismiss our anger. Just you know, try to suppress it, or you know, I'm I'm. I'm now a, a good Buddhist, so I shouldn't be angry. Uh, I think rather we should listen deeply to anger. I think the problem is when, um, like always, the, the problem is unawareness and autopilot. And, and, and yes, there is, I mean, there's this really afflictive 
heart of anger that just want to hurt people. Like you said, I, I, I didn't want to hurt them, but kind of I did <laughs> because they're idiots. You know, I mean, that's that's part of anger. And maybe that's not. I think, um, I, think I left that yeah. everyone. I think I left that box um, that I let it let, let let myself text to everyone because I usually never do that. I think I accidentally yeah. did that on purpose for sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> And I mean, I, I, at this, um, actually at this, this mindfulness conference in, in Melbourne, I had the opportunity to, um, um, I gave a talk to get together with a, a dear friend, um, who does, um, uh, her name is Jane Lewis. She does these, um, anti-racism, uh, amazing anti-racism, racism workshops. And she's a practitioner. So she was presenting material on anti-racism and, and I was uh, leading um, mindfulness or con the four foundations of mindfulness contemplations as a way of for people to kind of integrate and stay with whatever these kind of hard topics uh, would, would you know, trigger or uh, you, know, you, you get to see your own unconscious biases and so on and that's kind of uncomfortable. So. So I added a like a mindfulness component to that, but yeah. So I but but looking at you know if you look at minorities how they've been treated and how they are being treated, you know the in Australia it was it was legal to kill Aboriginals up until the sixties because they were actually uh, they were classified as animals, so you could just go out and shoot them and there would be no legal ramifications whatsoever, <laughs> and and up until t today, when there's so much structural racism and so much internalized uh, racism in, in all of us that we might not even be aware of, and these people are being uh, treated in a completely unacceptable way. And I mean, for that, what, what, could be, what could be the response to that other than anger? And how could that anger, you know, not be justified? Or, um, or the way that that uh, the female voice has been uh, silenced throughout history, you know, so much wisdom. Uh, what, about this? what if it doesn't make you angry? What if it doesn't? Yeah. And you have to be in society around people who, who um, treat people like me, who it doesn't make angry, treat me like I'm some kind of a, you know, like a, a demon. Um, I yeah. feel like I can't even, you know, admit that the stuff does not make me angry. Um, and I, usually I don't because I know that that hurts other people. But, um, you know, it doesn't make everyone angry. I, it is terrible. No. I, I didn't hear what you said before about them shooting Aborigines. That is terrible, yes. But it doesn't make me angry, like, to the point where I'm, I'm beside myself over it. You know what I'm saying? Yes, it's no. not right, but... <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you were an Aboriginal, uh, then it would more likely make you angry. Um, potentially and you know the the way in a sense the way you know even now the way um uh, uh women are being treated in our society that that's i guess it's more likely to make you angry if you're a woman unfortunately but you know in a way it should make <laughs> it should make everyone um angry to an to an extent so so i, I don't think uh yeah, I, I think like everything. So the, the problem is that there's this pureed soup, uh, as Venerable Rubina would say, of things that are useful and wholesome and things that are just rubbish and, and harmful to us. So just like we, we conflate attachment with love, um, we, there are things in our anger that needs to kind of be dissected and uh, separated because some of the anger is really afflictive and not useful and based in just delusion and misconception. Um, whereas some of that anger uh, can actually provide us with some wisdom if we look into it uh, more deeply. And then of course, there's always the, the issue of our behavior. So sometimes maybe uh, you know, anger will arise and it might even energize us. And we, if we can just hold that 
and not try to suppress it, not think, oh, this is just a non-Buddhist bad thing. I shouldn't have any of this. But if we instead can uh, just hold it, uh, allow for it to be there, give it space, and then look into it and see what is, is there some wisdom in this? Is there some clarity? Uh, and then transform potentially like that, that anger into skillful action then you know that could be super useful but uh we still have to be especially you know when if we're really if our minds are really untrained then we have to pay great great um um we have to pay pay great attention to our behavior so like the, the initial stages would be to just zip it and, you know, maybe if you're too angry in a conversation, just excuse yourself and go to the bathroom and, and breathe for a while because you're just going to make a mess of it. Um, so in, in the beginning, just paying attention to our behavior so we don't say hurtful things or, you know, even physically hurt someone or, you know, whatever it might be. That's super important. but. Um, I still think we uh, we can um, then if we look deeply into our anger and see kind of start to dissect the layers of it and then you know all the component parts of it then um, then that can make a huge huge difference. But we can't do any of that if we just think you know I'm I'm a good holy Buddhist now so I should never be angry. Uh, yay me and then we're just um you know we're just suppressing and pretending and, and bypassing a lot of things that uh we really should be having a lead uh, like a deeper look into um yeah i'm just a personal I, I don't know if i shared this here in this context before but um uh before i was a parent uh <laughs> this is when you know i've I've meditated for a few years. I've read lots of Buddhist books and I was just feeling, oh, I can't remember the last time I was angry. I'm, I must be a very holy person now. <laughs> this, this meditation must really be working uh, because, you know, I'm so calm and patient and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, then um, my daughter was born and, uh, you know, boy, did she show me the anger because uh, she could, you know, push all the right buttons and she wouldn't stop pushing them. Uh, and then I just found all this material, all this stuff that I was just completely unaware of. Uh, and okay, so up with that shit and then, you know, you work through it and um, and then there'd just be layers and layers and layers of, uh, of stuff that's kind of just ready to um, be brought into the, the light of awareness. Uh, and um, yeah, so uh, I think the people who they meditated for a while and now they're so calm and holy, I think that's like one of my, I can't remember which teacher, but he just said too holy too soon. <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, yeah, we, we shouldn't be afraid of our, uh, our anger. We should, um, we should really welcome it uh, as a messenger or something and, and, hold it with you know uh, space and awareness and and love but listen to it and not try to suppress it i guess um yeah so this is uh, a very helpful discussion to me uh, i really do appreciate it and danny's comments because i've been seeing like when i get angry which happens well sometimes as three steps forward and two steps back or no two steps forward and three steps back and so, um, like, for instance, I got in an argument with my brother, whom I love very much, but except for his political views and um, involving supporting some politicians who do promote racism. And I got really angry at him today and told him I never want to speak to him again, which isn't true. And he knows it. And yet, that is an angry moment between us. And, and then I start feeling bad, you know, so it's, it's helpful to realize, yes, anger is sometimes appropriate, but it's how you deal with it. And sometimes I don't mm -hmm. deal with it very well. And 
I guess that's partly why I'm here. I'm trying to figure out ways. Mm. That's all. So how do you learn yeah, thank from you. this anger? How do you get wisdom from anger? I'm looking for an example, if you have one. Um, <clears throat> well, I think, um, uh, I mean, the, the first step would be to um, investigate and see like what is, uh, what is causing this anger? Um, is there, you know, is there some injustice or, uh, you know, maybe, um, maybe someone is treating you in a way that, that means that you should be um, asserting some, some boundaries. Um, you know, there's just on a very conventional and, practical level is is this actually is there some conventional truth to this anger uh is there something you know this is and this is like um because anger has this it does have this sharpness and sometimes clarity to it that can see things um clearly that that are actually that needs to be corrected or addressed or or fixed so there's i mean there's that kind of um uh, there can be that kind of, of wisdom in anger. But then, if, then if when, it's it's, rec- when it's, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, if it's a recurring anger on like the same issues that keep bubbling up in your, in someone's mind, is that something that's not being dealt with or uh, it, it just hasn't come to a certain um, enlightenment within oneself to understand and say, you know what, I'm overdoing this or whatever the case may be. I just got to let it go or I got to deal with it one way or another. Yeah. And, and I guess you need to just like look deeply into that because um, for example, uh, for a lot of people, anger comes from uh, a lack of, um, yeah, like a lot of people are not being their own best friends uh, to put it that way, you know, uh, it's very common for us to be self-critical and harsh and feeling like we're not good enough. And, uh, you know, we, we're treating ourselves internally like we would never treat, you know, let alone our good friends, but not even yeah. we treat no one like the way we sometimes <laughs> treat ourselves. And that's, you know, that's causing a lot of anger and we're feeling we're inadequate and, um, so maybe the, the answer to that anger is self-compassion, uh, self-love, self-care, um, cultivating, um, you know, awareness around the ways we're not being just nice to ourselves, you know, and starting to be more nice to ourselves. So that, that could be the root of anger for, for many. Um, but then, then there is also, there seems to be this, uh, when you, especially when you're when you're starting to practice and you, you set out on some kind of spiritual path or you start meditating and you go deeper, then sometimes there can just be stuff that's just bubbling up like mud from some primordial cesspool of, of I don't know what. Uh, so then it seems like I'm just this is this is anger and I, I have no idea where, where is it coming from. It's just blah like uh and then that seems to be things that you just kind of have to work through so like it's like a purification of of uh deeper and deeper layers of the mind it's like uh it's like the dr- the, the dredging of the lake or something you know you're you're going deeper so this is just um yeah pulling up all this stuff that's for whatever reason down there. And I don't know, that might be anger from lifetimes ago. I, I'm not sure how the, the process works. I just identified or I've just observed this in myself and others that, and, and the important thing there is to see that, okay, this is this anger is just arising, but what we do is we project it outwards. So now we find a reason, we find something to just, because uh, we can't see the reason for the anger. So then we make one up. 
and we project it onto, oh, it's that person's horrible, that situation is bad. Um, and now we justify the anger uh, that kind of just bubbled up in us. Um, so, so the important thing there is to be aware of, okay, this is some free floating anger just arising in consciousness. Okay, I'll just hold it. I'll just sit with it. I'll just give it some space. Uh, and then eventually it will, it will transmute into something else. But the problem is, again, the unawareness, the autopilot, just, that just makes us vomit that anger out upon the world. Uh, and then we just make a mess of everything. So, so the yes, I guess my point is that, yeah. Sorry, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Sorry, finish your thought. No, I was just going to say that we need to to see clearly there's no one size fits all in how to deal with with anger. Uh, I mean, the, the one the one size fits all would be, yeah, well, bring more awareness and more compassion to it. And but, you know, in, in the details, it it will differ on how to to approach it and how to relate to it and how to deal with it, I guess. Yeah. So the transmuting can be unhelpful as well. Uh, 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 if you're unaware if, you yeah, know, if you're saying, then, uh, you're addressing just... it onto someone else or onto one other thing and yeah so you can you can transmute your anger into skillful action uh with wisdom and compassion like these wrathful deities in buddhism they're you know they're so strong in the in how they address um the world and i've seen you know i've seen um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, where he's, uh, for example, there was one situation where he was being told about injustices perpetrated towards women, and he just this was during a lunch or something. He just slammed his fist in the table, and you know, cups went flying, and he just this needs to stop. You know, so wrathful, so strong, but obviously there's no there's no hatred in his mind at that point. But so. Yes, we can transmute the anger into skillful action, uh, but we can also, you know, that, that anger can come out as, as us just making a complete mess of everything and, and hurting ourselves and others and just digging the, the, the hole deeper and, and, you know, and meshing ourselves deeper in samsara. So it's, um, yeah, but the energy of anger is just energy. Then what? Do we make of that? I guess. Danny has Thank some you. comments in the chat. I'll read them for you really fast. Um, yeah. with, me, with me, my anger usually stems from impatience with a lack of compassion for others. I got into a bad habit of expressing anger early in life and it just spiraled led, um, later until I decided it was going to hurt me via imprisonment. So I use Buddhist practice to learn self-control, at least enough to control to not go to prison or to get myself killed. Yes. I mm. like <laughs> <laughs> And um, yeah, and that is the controlling body speech and mind, which is, you know, controlling mind is, is the trickier of the three, but just, and that's why, that's why the foundation of all Buddhist practice uh, is ethics, is morality, and that morality starts in behavior. Uh, you know, that's where there are, there are rules in all the religions. You know, don't do this, do that, don't do that. Uh, like, yeah, don't, don't hit people over the face or kill them. Don't, don't steal their stuff. Don't, you know, don't rape them. <laughs> you know, whatever it might be don't don't yell at people don't um don't gossip don't lie don't uh you know spread rumors uh etc etc i mean there there are these, these these rules and they those rules are there to initially just control our behavior uh in, and start to bring uh, bring some sanity to uh to our situation so it, it kind of has that's and that's why anger is so often portrayed as the bad guy because yeah it's uh it's anger started all the wars you know anger created all the domestic violence anger and so on so of course you know it's easy to see oh that's the enemy uh and and the 
beginning stages, we need to do exactly what you're saying, Donnie. You just have to bring that under control uh, and um, ethical frameworks and, uh, and, and all these rules are how we do that. But then, you know, the more, the more awareness, the more compassion, the more wisdom, the more clarity we cultivate, the less we're going to need the rules because now uh, like ethical behavior is just arising spontaneously from, from a place of wisdom and compassion, but uh, none of us are there yet. So there's always this, this element of, of just, uh, yeah, even though we have the impulse of hitting someone in the face, we kind of have to <laughs> not do that. Uh, and yeah, that's always going to be the first and initial level in dealing with those things. So, yeah, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's really um, sage advice. Um, yeah, we have, um, there's a few more minutes if there are any, um, uh, additional comments. I, I really, I really appreciate, um, you sharing the ways that, um, uh, you're dealing with anger and, and have worked with anger in your own lives. That's, that's really helpful. I just have to go back to the politics. I just have to avoid it. There's just no way around it. Um, it <laughs> it's just one of those things where I, I think that as a society, we may have to go back to that whole um, manner thing where, you know, you just don't talk about religion and politics at the dinner table. Uh, Mm. <laughs> I, I think so because um yeah i i've lost friends and um i'm not willing to to part with friends anymore so i just i have my beliefs and they'll stay my beliefs i don't need to share them with anybody <laughs> yeah and i think um so two important aspects of that one is you know how much you know what 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 good does it do if we're fuming over Trump on the TV? How is that going to help anything? Uh, I mean, it's not like we're, you know, we're not going to start our own political party and, and go out and affect some, some big change in the world, most likely. You know, some people are in a position where they can do that maybe, but most of us aren't. So why, why are we getting upset about things that over which we have no control? Uh, so that's that's one thing and the other thing is if we meet people who are of you know they have diametrically opposed viewpoints and worldviews um i think in my experience uh most people you know have good intentions most people are kind and, and helpful uh but some of them you know might be more or less confused and and who knows maybe you know, for many years, I had uh, <laughs> I did my meditation, and not all of my meditation, but part of my practice was just, I basically meditated on the mantra, I'm wrong. Like, I am wrong, because I am wrong, you know, ultimately, uh, I'm, I'm deluded about the nature of reality. And, and I'm really attached to my ideas and viewpoints and, you know, be them, you know, be they, I mean, the Buddha clearly said that don't get attached to any views. Don't get attached to Buddhism, for God's sake. It's not, it's provisional. You know, it's helpful, but it's not the ultimate truth. It's because uh, conventional truth cannot never be ultimate. So, so just being aware that, you know, I might be wrong. Who knows? Maybe, maybe Trump is onto something. <laughs> he probably isn't, but uh, you never know. No, so then, you know, if you meet that too, the same thing. 
the, what you've been saying. I've been thinking a lot about that. You know, like ants who who maybe don't know all what that we're what what we're all, all above them. You know, ants is a viewpoint yeah. of it. Yeah, well, we're like that, except for, for the the entire entire universe or whatever. We're so tiny, we have no idea what's going on beyond this tiny little thing that we mm. think is correct. And that's what I bring myself to when I find myself getting too rigid with, okay, this is how it is. You know, I like what yeah. you said. Yeah, maybe Trump is on to something. If you could just, yeah, we don't know what the heck is going on. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, Honestly, for all we know, Trump could be a fully enlightened Buddha who's doing the things he's doing because that's exactly what is needed for some some reason that we are completely unaware of. And he's, I don't you know, we we really literally can't know. So um, so so I think um, what we can know, however, is that you know if we're meeting a person who holds a specific view and it's not the view we hold i mean our job is to love them our our love our our our, uh, our job is to uh to develop compassion and love and care and 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 just be the best we can in relation to them and everyone else that's because if we do that we can i don't think we can ever go wrong uh, but if we if we treat people badly just because they have a viewpoint that's different than ours, that's that's not that's not going to turn out well. Uh, so yeah, uh, Martin. Um, yes, yeah. I, I understand all of that. I agree with that, and uh, I try to avoid political discussions at all costs. I try not to watch it on TV. Mm. But how can we not feel some level of anger when people are actually trying to? burn down the planet, burn down the Amazon jungle, create havoc for the entire earth. And I don't feel anger, so citizens. people can. Not how how, can, how yeah. can we not feel <laughs> anger that they don't turn that, that they don't even seem to care about that and want to turn it to skillful means at the same time I myself need to turn the anger to skillful means. I, It's really hard for me to reconcile. Yeah. Point of view. I th Very hard. I think one... Um, one way of viewing that has been helpful to me is um you know if you saw you know if you came across uh like um say like a wounded animal uh and you know they maybe they're stuck in a trap or something and when you're trying to help them they're just you know they're attacking you and you know if someone you know some some other animal comes back they'll attack them and they're just lashing out and but you know that this is this is out of pain and hurt and ignorance, you know, or if you, if you come across a psychotic crazy person and they're saying, just saying all sorts of things and they're hurting people left and right. And you kind of, you might even have to like restrain them, but you don't do that from a place of hatred because you understand that this is coming from delusion. This is coming from suffering. Uh, and that helps you to, you know, you might have to restrain them. You have to maybe have to do all sorts of things, but you can still keep uh, compassion for them and the understanding and love. So I think that's that's the tricks because people who are hurting the planet, they're doing that out of confusion and delusion and ignorance, you know, at the deepest, deepest level. Um, they're like psychotic people. I mean, we're all like crazy people. In a sense, we're all psychotic, uh, and how could you not? How can you not have compassion with that? Because this, the amount of suffering they're causing, also, and if you have the view of karma, the the amount of suffering they're causing for themselves and countless coming lifetimes, it's 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 heartbreaking. It's terrible. Uh, but then you still have to go about and you know stop them from doing the things they're doing potentially. But it can be from a place of deep understanding deep compassion um rather than hatred and and um loathing and yeah these other states of minds yeah that's i don't know if that's, it's, that's is, yeah. basically what you're saying is be the change you want to see yeah 
and ultimately you're living in your you're living in your universe i mean uh you're living in your mandala in your world um and it's you know there are different different ways of looking at it but one way of looking at it is certainly that this is the the fruits of your karma everything so uh you know if you're if you're angry with anything you should be angry with your own the root delusions that caused this whole mess um which isn't again maybe not be helpful because then again understanding compassion clarity and wisdom might be a better response even if you're taking all of it on board and you know uh but but so the point is the transformation has to happen in you that's the only the only true if change you can affect is on yourself uh so cultivate love cultivate compassion cultivate awareness cultivate wisdom cultivate clarity and then you will see the world around you changing uh at least that would be the buddhist world view and that's how you transform the world by transforming the mind and the only mind you can transform is your mind um we've got a lot yeah. of <laughs> <laughs> Whew. Yeah, so we, uh, let's get to it then. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, trust trust your own Buddha nature. It's uh, it's it's uh, desperately calling to you to um, for you to pay attention to it and allow it to spring forth and transform this this world into a pure land so that's uh next item on the agenda for today <laughs> and with that we can um again just uh as we set a good intention good motivation at the start we can just um, at the end of the session, just dedicate whatever, you know, whatever insights arose, whatever um, positive energy um, was generated. We can just uh, dedicate that to uh, the welfare of all sentient beings and to the ultimate awakening of, of everyone. So that's the kind of thing that's going to heal the world. and. Uh, yeah, so we can just rejoice in the fact that maybe we um, explored wisdom and compassion and and those kind of things during this hour, and we just release it into the world. We don't try to hold on to anything of it as being ours. Um, we don't. We shouldn't allow it to generate any pride in our minds or any grasping to. Uh, to any of it we just release it uh, and may it be a benefit to to as many as possible and with that uh, i thank you for this session today it's been um i had fun <laughs> i hope you did too uh, thank you you, thank you. you and um shayla i'll see you i think soon at eddie's okay bye susan i'll probably see you soon too I'll see Happy you there. Thanksgiving or whatever. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Take care. All right.